we're seeing what the Bible says out of the Song of Solomon about married love. And uh, Solomon wrote 1,005 songs, and the uh, Song of Solomon is his best one. He said that. Uh, really, the proper title for the book of Song of Solomon is really the Song of Songs. And so out of all the songs, out of 1,005 songs that he wrote, this is the best one. So we're kind of examining what the Bible says out of the book of Song of Solomon about married uh, love. Uh, now, we said last time a couple of ground rules. Uh, number one, don't tune me out. If you've been married for a long time and you think you got it down or you haven't been married or you're not married or you're between marriages or whatever, don't tune me out. This is about relationships. It's about love. And there's something for everybody. Number two, receive these teachings for you. Don't be elbowing. Don't be saying, you need to, that's you, buddy. Don't do that. All right. Uh, you can get killed. And so uh, receive these teachings for you, uh, there's something for you, and don't worry about your mate or anybody else. Don't say, man, I wish they had heard this. If they'd have been here, they'd have heard this, but that's, that's not what we're all about. And then number three, forget the past. We have all have regrets in the past. We all have things we wish we could have done different in the past. But uh, one thing I know, God makes all things new. Do I have anybody who believes that? We just have a big amen today, all right? And uh, we, we believe that. And so today's a brand new day. Doesn't matter, you're gonna get it right now. And so just you know, leave the past behind. Today's a brand new day. Now, last time we said that soulmates uh, see the beauty and value uh, in each other. Uh, and we realize that marriage in Christ, and this is what we're talking about, uh, soulmates in Christ uh, sees the value because that's what Jesus did for us. He saw the beauty and value uh, in us. And then I finished up telling you what uh, I, I, I really want to happen during these next several weeks together uh, in this series, that, that we would learn to love each other, not by seeing uh, your spouse as perfect, but by seeing your imperfect spouse in God's perfect way. And uh, that's our desire throughout this series. So you might want to take notes and sit beside each other, uh, that kind of thing. And so um, we're going we're gonna to give you some principles that apply to, to all, of, all, all of marriage. Now, let, let me give you this one principle uh, that, um, that, that really applies to everything, not just marriage, but applies to everything. I want you to write it down. You, you ought to be a note taker during this series. You really should. It's kind of like a mini conference, right? And by the way, uh, in September, we are going to have a marriage conference. Uh, we're going to have a uh, Friday and a Saturday and a Sunday marriage conference. That's coming up. You'll be hearing a lot about that. And let me tell you, 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 you want to know, well, what, 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 what do the men do? Uh, and, and we want guys to sign up for the wild game night and everything. We want you to pay $12 and all that. But you know what the, what the men, their, our desire is to do is to be able to pay for this conference. The men want to pay for the conference for their wives. And we want to pay for the conference so, you, so couples don't have to pay anything if they can't afford it. And that's going to be awesome. That's going to be in September. You don't want to miss that. All right. But let me give you a principle uh, that applies to everything uh, in life. And that's this. I want you to listen to me. Listen to me. Say amen. Come on. How you play determines how you practice. In other words, you play like you practice. I, I, I'm mesmerized when I see these musicians up here. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, they got, they got a boatload of talent, but I promise you, they have spent hours and hours in practicing. And that's why, that's why they can play the way they do. Uh, and that applies to everything. In other words, we all want the end result. And, and whatever the end result is, you got to put the time into it. It just doesn't happen overnight. So how you pay determines how you practice. And so if you want love in your marriage, you want love in your home, then, uh, then you have to practice that. Are you willing to put the time and effort in? And by the way, this applies to everything. Uh, this will apply to your finances. Dave Ramsey, who's probably made more millionaires in America than, any, than anybody in, in the world, says this. He said, you, if, you wanna, if you wanna be sound financially, there comes a time when you've gotta live like nobody else so that you can live like nobody else. So what does he mean by that? He means, well, you know, there's, there's some things you've got to give up. There's some, you've got to put some time into it. You can't, you can't have credit card debt, you know, running out of your, your nose. Uh, you, you gotta, you've got to, you know, maybe get that grocery getter, not drive that brand new car for a while and, or whatever it may be. You've got to live like nobody else so that you can live like nobody else. In other words, he said, you got to put the, you got to put the time into it. You, we all want the end result and we all want the end result in marriage. Every, every marriage, every family here wants love. In your marriage, every spouse wants to love each other, but are you willing to put the time? How you play 
will determine how you practice, or how you practice will determine how you play. Are you willing to put the time and energy uh, into that? Now, let me begin today by telling you a true story. Uh, this is uh, Norman Wright writes about this. He talks about this. Now, Norman Wright uh, is a great marriage counselor, theologian, uh, famous author, and he talks about in the early days of his marriage how he had this in his mind, this design and this desire for his wife. Uh, but he had ex- such great expectations for his wife, but he found in the early years of their marriage, and even though he's a marriage counselor, he discovered that he was pushing her away rather than drawing her to him. And, uh, and it just kind of, you know, it just didn't click. Something wasn't just right. Then he read an article, a Reader's Digest article called An Eight Cow Wife. An Eight Cow Wife. Now, by the way, you see an article that says an Eight Cow Wife. You got to read that, right? And so uh, this is what Norman Wright did. And he started reading the article. And the article is a true story about a man who lived in the South Pacific Islands, and his name was Johnny Lingo. Now, Johnny Lingo was looking for a wife. But on the South Pacific Island, you didn't have currency. But if you wanted to have a wife, you had to present her father with a cow. Now, the woman that Johnny Lingo chose was not wife material as far as the village was concerned. She was very backward. She was very shy. Uh, Nobody really thought much about her. And so um, in that village, if you presented a a woman, uh, her father with a cow, that was pretty normal. Uh, That's that's a one cow wife. And then very rarely did somebody give three or four cows for a wife. And only the most beautiful women on the island, somebody would give her father up to four cows. But here's a woman that Johnny Lingo chose And it was out of sheer love because he loved her so much that he presented her father with eight cows, eight cows. It was unheard of. She, it was the most expensive uh, wedding, the most expensive price that anybody had ever paid for a woman on that island. And Norma Wright read this article and and they found out it revolutionized her life. All of a sudden, this woman started looking at herself. She, she came out of her shyness. She came out of her backwardness. And she became this, this beautiful leader in the community. Why? Because she began to realize that she was valuable. She, be, she began to, how he paid for her and how he practiced with her is the end result. And she became a beautiful, wonderful wife and leader in that village. Guys, I want you to turn right now. Turn to your wife right now. If you're sitting beside her, and you should be, say, you are worth more than eight cows to me. Go ahead, do that right now. Right now, do it. You're worth more than eight cows to me. And you better make sure you said those exact words because you get in trouble, Bubba, if you look at your wife and say anything about a cow. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? All right. You're, 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 it's amazing. Only at Aaron Lake can you look at your wife and I mention the word cow and she go, oh, but anyway, so, uh, so it revolutionized her life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, and this is one of the reasons why we have the book of Solomon uh, in in the Bible in the first place. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did for us? You and I were hell deserving sinners. You and I can't be good enough for Jesus. We can't do enough for Jesus. We can't give enough. We can't go to church enough. You can't get baptized enough. You can't take confrontation uh, enough. You can't light enough candles, whatever it may be. But Jesus, we, you and I had nothing to offer Jesus whatsoever. We were sinners. We all came short of the glory of God, but yet Jesus in his glory, Jesus in his wisdom, Jesus in his grace and his mercy, he looked down from heaven's glory and he said, I love you. You do nothing for me. You can offer me nothing, but that doesn't matter. I love you and I love you so much that I'm going to pay the highest price that anybody could possibly pay for your soul. I'm going to take my blood and die for you. You are very valuable. Jesus has invested into you and let nobody diminish that. You are the most valuable thing in the heart of God. You are worth more. One single soul in this building right now is worth more to God than everything in this world. And it's time we start owning up to that and giving back Jesus a little bit of our love. Somebody say amen. Somebody give Jesus a hand clap of praise today. Amen. Right. Man, it's time, it's time. We just quit sitting there and looking at our watches and quit, uh, you know, having business as usual. God invested into us and God's dear name. Let's give back some of that love to him. And this changed this woman's life. She all of a sudden saw herself as valuable in his sight. And that's what we're talking about. 
That's what we're talking about. Now, uh, Norman Wright said that this woman just ended up becoming this, this beautiful woman inside and out and a great leader in her, in her village. Now today, in Song of Solomon, we are, we are going to go to where it's before their marriage. Now they're going to get married and they're going to have their honeymoon. Now let me just say this next week. Everybody say next week. Next week, we're going to have a sermon on sex. Everybody say sex, all right? You can have sex in church. Now, uh, it's going to be on their wedding night. And, uh, and I already told you, it's, it's, it's going to be awesome. But here's, here's the deal. Uh, this will be a great time to have your children in our preschool uh, venues and our children's venues. We have excellent ch- uh, children in preschool ministries. And uh, this is going to be a PG-13 sermon next week. I'm just going to take, I'm not going to get crude with it. I'm going to take it right out of the word of God. But... There's going to be talking about some things that you may not, you think your child is ready for, and that's okay, we get that. Uh, Andrew and Brittany are going to take any 12 and 11-year-olds that are not in our children's department, they're going to have something for them. Uh, if you're uncomfortable with that, you don't have to do that, but if you're, we're going to take away every excuse. But next week, you don't want to miss it because it's going to be on their wedding night. It's going to be awesome. It's all night long, you remember? All right, so, so you don't want to miss that. That's next week. Now, what we're taking it up today is before they get married. And this is a great lesson. This is a great sermon today, a great message today. For those of you that are not married yet, you long for marriage, or maybe you're engaged. And so we're gonna, we're gonna look at, uh, at that uh, of, of b- before their wedding. So everybody take your uh, Bible. Turn with me please to the book of Solomon, Solomon chapter two. Solomon chapter two, beginning at verse uh, eight. And by the way, the Shulamite woman here is the one doing most of the speaking. She's doing all the, all the talking. Remember who she's talking to, where she's singing to? She's singing to the daughters of Jerusalem. This is her court. Uh, these are the young maids, the ones that are not married yet. And, and really, they're just touting and, sh- and, and, and singing and shouting about the joy of anticipated love, anticipated marriage, and married, married love. Uh, Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 8. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and he said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Oh, this is good. I mean, this is, I mean, this guy, he is, he is, they are in love. All right. Everybody say they are in love. All right. Now look at, look at verse 14. Oh, my dove. The clefts of the rock and the secret places of the cliff. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Now I realize today's Mother's Day. And I, you may be disappointed I'm not preaching a Mother's Day sermon. But I'm just telling you, as I was thinking about this and I was praying about this, I thought, you know what? There ain't a mother here that wouldn't want this kind of love for her child. There's not a mother here that wouldn't want her daughter to marry a man like this. There's not a, there's not a woman here that wouldn't want her, her uh, son to, to have a woman like this. And so you know that. All mothers know that. And uh, this man, Solomon, has literally captured her heart. And, uh, and, we, and we see that. Five times she says, five times she calls him my love, my love, my love. And there's powerful words in that. First of all, he's my love. Uh, he belongs to me and I belong to him. There, we, we have, there, there, he has eyes for nobody else. I have eyes for nobody else. We're not, there's no flirting. There's no second guessing. Here is my love. And then she said, he is my love. He is the love of my life. That's what God intends for. That's, how, that's what soulmates do. The love of my life. Her heart is his and his heart uh, is hers. Now, I want you to, on, on, on this Mother's Day, let me give you three things very quickly of what love really is, what soulmates really feel about each other and, and how that works. Number one, and you might want to put this down. First of all, you say you love each other by your actions. You say you love each other by your actions. Now she hears him before she sees him. Now go to verse eight. The voice of my beloved below, b- behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. He comes leaping. You know what that means? Everybody, everybody listen. You know what it means? It means he can't wait to see her. That means he has her, she has his attention. That means he's not aloof. 
That means that, that, that he is there for her. And we all know, some of you in your homes, but this is how you know if you have soulmates or roommates, some of you at home. Some of you guys, bless your heart, you're there, but you're not there. You're at home, but you're not there. You don't give each other the attention that's due. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do everything together. I get that. But my wife and I don't do everything together. By the way, next month, we will celebrate 45 years of wonderful marriage. Not perfect marriage, no such thing, but 45 years of marriage. But we don't do everything together. We don't feel like we got it. Everybody knows I like to play a little bit of golf. Somebody asked me not long ago, they said, man, does Phyllis play golf with you? No, thank God she doesn't. We would kill each other. You know what I'm saying? You know. Plus, I don't know what she scored because she might cheat. But anyway, so, so, but they have each other's attention. He comes to her. He can't wait to see her. Do you feel that way? Do y'all feel that way about each other? It doesn't mean you have to do everything together, but do you, do you long to see each other? I'm telling you right now, God is, God is my witness, man. After 45 years of marriage, when I, when I know that her car is in the, in the driveway, I know she's at home. Man, I just can't wait to see her. She's my best friend. I love her so much, and we want to be around each other. Now, listen, I want to tell you something. You know what you need to do? You, you ought to do it today. Today's Mother's Day. But in God's dear name, put down the cell phone and put down Facebook and get off the Xbox, Bubba, and start paying attention to one another. And all God's people say it. Man, you ought to do that. When you're there, you're not there. Oh, listen, his attention is all about her, man. He comes leaping on the hill. I mean, you know, he can't wait. This is giddy. It is kind of almost stupid. But that's how, that's how they feel about each other. Oh, listen, he loves, he loves her. He's giving her her attention. So uh, he's showing her he loves her by his actions, by the fact that he's given her attention, by he can't wait to see her. Does your wife know that about you? Do you say that, listen, you, can you not wait to get home, see each other? That's what soulmates do. Number, number two, not only by your actions, but number two, you say you love each other with your eyes. Did you get that? You, ever, you understand that? When was the last time y'all looked at each other? I mean, you really looked at each other in the eyes. Your eyes tell you a lot, by the way. Uh, somebody said your eyes are the window to your soul. And he say they, and they love each other with their eyes. Look, look, look at verse 9. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. No, he's not a stalker. That's creepy, all right? But you know what it means? You know what it means? It means, listen, by the way, they're not married yet. You know what it means? Listen to me. Listen to me. Say amen. Come on. It means he's willing to wait. It means that he loves her from afar. It means that they don't have to do anything. It means that they don't have to hook up. It means they don't have to move in together to prove his love. It means that he is perfectly satisfied with not finding out if they're compatible or not. He already knows it because of how he, he doesn't, he doesn't matter about her. He knows how he loves her. And, and it means that they're willing to wait. Now, I want you, young people, listen to me. Uh, do I have any teenage girls in the house? Let me hear it from you. Let me hear it. Yeah. yeah. I got three of you. All right. <laughs> Put your cell phone down right now and look at your pastor. All right. Because I've got, I got a word for you. Are you dating a guy right now? And he says, if you'll love me, you'll let me. I'm telling you, you need to drop that guy like a hot potato. And if he keeps pressuring you, that's right. Come on now, put your phone down, listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. And if he presses you and says, you love me, you'll let me, then in God's dear name, and you tell him your pastor said so. And I can back it up because we got men in this church that are barely saved and they know how to kill people for a living. (laughs) Amen? That's right. And if he tells you, you love me, you'll let me, in God's dear name, you slap his face to his ears are ringing like a chapel bell. And you tell him, my preacher told me to do that. Come on, somebody. Amen. Oh, I'm preaching now. You don't have to have somebody. You don't have to give it away. You don't have to move in together. Listen, he loves her from afar. He says, my eyes are for you. And by the way, I want to say something to the guys. I want you to listen to me, guys. If you're hooked on porn and you can't understand why your wife is so upset because she called you at 2 o'clock in the morning on the internet looking at pornography. And, you th- and I know what, I've heard it a thousand times. Come on, you ain't going to tell me something I ain't already heard a thousand times. And I hear guys say all the time, well, it didn't do nothing. It was just, I was just looking, wasn't touching. Let me tell you something, Bubba. You listen to me and you listen well. 
Yeah, you did do something too. Let me tell you what you did. You took your eyes off her. You took your eyes off your wife. And it broke her heart because you dishonored her. And you looked at what you shouldn't be looking at. Your wife wants your eyes to be on her. And all God's women said, that's right, that's right. And you wonder, well, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. You dishonored her. Look at her only. That's why it's such a big deal. Oh, listen, they love each other. They love each other even from a distance. They're not going to get together. They're not going to hook up. Oh, they're going to, but they can wait. He looks at me through the windows. He, gave, he longs for the day we can get it. But there's a season. There's a season for that. Listen, I want to tell you something. Some preacher gets up here and tells you that sex is bad. Don't you believe it? It's good. I thought I'd get more amens to that. Well, <laughs> well, if you have a relationship I have, you, 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 it's good. And I'm going to talk about this next week. The devil did not invent sex. God invented it. Sex is God's idea. But let me tell you something. It's in its time. It's in its time. You understand what I'm saying? And so listen, he said, look, I love you. I want you. I can't wait to be with you, but I'm willing to wait because there's a season for everything. And then, and then listen, uh, he, he puts his eyes on her. I, I, I read this. Danny Aiken who is the president of a Southeastern Baptist Seminary, said that back in, I think it was about 2006, he had an invitation to go see Billy Graham at Billy Graham's house and while Ruth Graham was still living. He said, I'll never forget this. I want y'all to listen to this. Uh, you know, Billy, Billy and Graham, Ruth Graham, the love they had for each other. Well, Ruth was, in, was on her deathbed. And he said that when he went to uh, Billy Graham's house up in Montreat, up in the mountains, he said Billy was by the bedside of Ruth holding her hand and he looked up at Danny Aiken and he said we're old now but we can still make love with our eyes and sometimes I'm going to tell you something that may be all you have are you willing to practice that you 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 play like you practice are you willing to do that? We can still make love. Listen, I want to tell you something. You look at each other every once in a while. Put the phone down. Get off the TV. Just look at each other once in a while. Oh, he, lo he loved it with his eyes. He loved it with his eyes. And then thirdly, not only do you love with your actions, and not only do you love with your eyes, but thirdly, certainly, you say it with your words. You love each other by your words. Don't, don't, don't minimize that. Say it. Say it often. Say it every day. Say it several times a day. Look at, look at verse 10. Get down to verse 10. He said, my beloved spoke and he said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now, by the way, he's not talking about come away. Let's go shack up. He's not talking away. Let's go out in the woods. I mean, by the way, we're engaged. What difference does it matter? No, you know what he's saying? He said, come on, I want to go for an old-fashioned walk. I want to go hand in hand. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you just took each other's hand and went for a walk? Uh, the other day, Phyllis and I, we were going to Walmart. Ain't nothing romantic about Walmart. Walmart, Walmart is the most unromantic place on God's green earth. Uh, Walmart's a strange place. Walmart, only place I know. You go in to get a loaf of bread and come out with a weed eater. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. We're going to Walmart. And we were going to Walmart off a of Skybo. You can get killed at that Walmart. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? But when we got out of the car, my, my wife took my hand. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm not kidding. Y'all think I'm crazy. But when she took my hand, that parking lot became the most romantic place. I'm, I'm going hand in hand. Walking hand in hand with my wife to Walmart. And that becomes romantic. Oh, come on. When's the last time you, when's the last time you took each other's hand? You say, preacher, our schedule's so busy. Hey, if you're too busy to turn off the TV and get off Facebook, put that phone down, get off the Xbox, and look each other in the eyes, or just grab your hands and hold each other's hands for a while, then you're just flat too busy. Give something else up. Oh, listen. They, uh, they said it. Look, look, look. He said, verse 10, My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away with me. I want to be with you. Let's, let's just hold hands. 
Verse 14, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. USA Today reported a, um, a survey that was done by a certain company that said that how young married couples speak to each other is more important than what they actually say. How you say it. Now, you may say all the right things, but it's how you say it is more important. And you know, this company that did the research said we can predict with 87% accuracy whether somebody's going to be divorced or not just by how they say what they say. Oh, listen, tell each other you love them and say it often. But look them in the eyes when you do that. Uh, you know, remember last week I talked about a kiss before you go off to work. Uh, my, my wife, bless her heart, she's always down in the preschool area, but she caught all of that on, online. She caught that on video. And this week, man, she has been planting it on me before I go to work. I mean, son, that's, that's why I'm so happy today. <laughs> but if you're going to tell each other you love them, mean it. Look them in the eye. Don't, don't think you're, you're telling them you're perfect. You, everything had to be perfect before you say that? No. You got nothing coming. That's ridiculous. Doesn't mean you don't have tension. Doesn't mean you don't have likes and dislikes. But you need to sit down and say you love them and say it often. Uh, too many marriages are in trouble. We know that. We know that. And by the way, I want, I want to say this. It's not as bad as you think. Ma there's nothing wrong with marriage. Marriage is intact. Marriage is good. Marriage is godly. And there are a lot of good and godly and wonderful marriage. And marriage gets a bum rap. And, and that's why so many people don't, they don't want to marry. They're afraid to marry because they hear the statistic that says one and two marriages in the divorce. That's not true, by the way. It's not. You know why they get that statistic? It's kind of a flawed statistic. They take the number of people that file for divorce and compare it to the number of marriage licenses that are filed for, and they put those together, and they forget all about the lasting marriages that are already there. So it's not one in two, but it's still way too high. But in America, it's still one in three. So the odds are against all of us. One in three is way too high. It's not one in two, glory to God for that, but one in three is way too high. Hey, you're going to fly on an airplane and you go up behind the counter and the woman behind the counter says, well, I got to let, let you know in this airline, one in three of these planes is going to crash. I ain't flying. Can we get an amen? If I go to a restaurant and they can deliver me a plate of food and say, we just got to let you know that everybody that eats here, one in three dies. I'm fasting and I'm praying. Can I get an amen? That's still way too high. Way too high. Odds are against you. But I'm telling you, you can celebrate married love. Your marriage can last. It doesn't have to be on the rocks. It's not over. But once again, that's why we have the book of Solomon in the Bible in the first place. To tell us, God invented it. It's God's idea. And Jesus can make it happen. What did Jesus say? He said, seek me first. You see, your first love is not your husband. Your first love is not your wife. Your first love has to be the Lamb of God. Can I get an amen on that? Jesus, if you love me first, come on. If you don't, don't worry about him. Don't worry about her. Forget that. They're imperfect. You know that. Quit trying to make them perfect. No, no such thing. It's the love triangle. You've seen that, right? You've seen the love triangle. You got a couple here and you got a couple here. And, and, and all of the marriage seminars try to bring this couple together just like this. Well, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to, you know, and, and they think, and that don't work. You can't bring this couple here and that couple, and you can't bring them together like that. But you take this couple, you take this man and you take this woman and you tell him, hey, look, look to Jesus. And you tell her, hey, look to Jesus. And if they'll do that, look what happens. I'm looking to Jesus. And as I get closer to Jesus, what happens? I get closer to my mate. That's why we have this book here. 
What about you? You love each other. I didn't say you're perfect. That you would see your imperfect spouse through the perfect eyes of Jesus. That's what soulmates are.